it's uh, very unfortunate that we're running behind time and won't be able to do this lecture. So um, we'll just go to the final vote. No. Um, you know, evidence-based, I'm evidence-based. Um, yeah, this is not awkward at all. So um, I think it's actually worth having the discussion, however. Um, how many people in the crowd here now are practicing outside of the United States? Okay, thank God there's more than 12% of you, okay? Because that's where I'm starting right now. He's got 88%, I got 12%. So I'm going to try and move the dial up. Um, I'm leading the witness here. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about other regimens, including Cyborg D and Bird. So I first of all want you to ignore what I said an hour ago when I said VRD was a standard of care, right? So this is where I sort of like wash your brains from the past, like la, 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 la. Uh, let, let's not forget that. Number two, I want to have a second disclaimer that my colleague here lives in New York, so his proximity uh, to Coleman and Nisvitsky makes me a little nervous that somehow he got the, uh, the VRD KRD arm. And thirdly, you know, he's sort of pathologically nice. So <laughs> it, it's difficult to debate someone that, that you like, you know. He, I noticed that even today, he, he decided to match me with a black suit, a blue shirt, and a purple tie. So, um, you know, there, there's a challenge in doing that. That being said, however, I do want us to recognize the fact that one size does not fits all. How many times do you come home from ASH or ASCO or EHA or one of these meetings and you see a, a beautifully designed phase three randomized trial, but the next day in clinic, it doesn't exactly fit with your patient? for a whole host of reasons. And this is where clinical medicine becomes important. And really the take home message today is, although VRD, KRD may be the first regimen we turn to in general, pragmatically, there are many patients in whom we either give a modified regimen like that or regimen like Cyborg D and BIRD. So what I wanna do is prove to you that not uh, all uh, patients should be treated the exact same way. There is additional toxicity and I'll give you my rules of two versus three, which is to say, do we always need those two, if you will, novel agents, um, or three, three drug uh, combinations? Do we always need a proteasome inhibitor and an imid together? And I would suggest that we don't need that every single time. And then finally, to recognize that there are some subpopulations in whom Cyborg D and BIRD, which are excellent regimens, as I'll demonstrate to you, uh, would be valid. So to keep it simple, uh, generally speaking, although there are huge variations on it, as we've just heard very often, a bortezomib-based regimen is given on a three-week regimen. Uh, we've tended at Mayo to default to a four-week regimen where we give all three drugs every week where we actually, uh, generally speaking, increase the bortezomib to 1.5 milligrams per meter squared subcutaneously weekly uh, and give the dexamethasone weekly. We've found this to be superior to a uh, 14811 regimen. We found this to be superior to three weeks on, one week off. It's simple, it's easy to remember for the patient. And actually, the dose delivered uh, when you go up to 1.5 is very similar to what you would have given in a twice weekly regimen with less neuropathy and less thrombocytopenia. So just from a practical, pragmatic standpoint, this is what we routinely do in clinical practice. And I would suggest to you maybe more efficacious than what you might see in some of the studies that present it with a lower dose. Similarly with BIRD, uh, this is of course a, uh, uh, the, the uh, um, antibiotic agent, if you will, uh, clarithromycin given 500 milligrams uh, POBID in addition to standard dosing of lenalidomide, which in general, of course, we give three weeks out of four at that dose as you see here. So why is it that three is not always better than two, uh, if you will, in terms of uh, using these active agents? And I'm going to show you very quickly eight reasons for this. The military analogy, toxicity cost, long-term survival, quality of life, the add-on approach, the biology of myeloma, and despite what we hear over and over about MRD, CR, or complete remission, I would suggest, is not always the goal, uh, but a good long life is. So, look, I'm the Canadian here today, and it's, it's a dangerous day to talk, to, or time to talk about the military in general. But as you know, we have five branches of the military. And if we're going to go to battle with all five of them, you know, God bless Merca, uh, chances are we're going to win, right? Or at least have a, a good chance of victory. But did we need all five? Did we need the Coast Guard there? Did we need the Navy there? Could we have done it with less? And yes, any time you do a clinical trial, 
that adds on another regimen, unless there's unacceptable toxicity, your response rate's gonna get better. And that's natural. And the comment I made during the Q&A I think is very important around some of the work we're doing in Arizona to predict an individual patient's response to a drug. Yes, of course, three drugs are gonna work better than two in general. How could they work less better than two in that you have more drugs there? But did you need all three? Did that third drug simply add toxicity and cost and not add to efficacy? And so we have to ask ourselves, do we really need that additional agent? And clinical trials may not always be predictive of your individual patient's results. It might show that in the overall population, and that is evidence-based. But remember, being a good Canadian, uh, evidence-based medicine is about the evidence that presented, but it's just as much about applying it to your individual patient. And just because a trial shows three is better than two, or four is better than three, or five is better than four, it doesn't necessarily mean every patient needs that. Number two, of course, as we mentioned, every drug comes with toxicity, unless it's mother's milk, literally everything comes with toxicity. We don't always know the long-term uh, toxicity of these drugs. It took us a while to understand some of the signal, albeit not very strong, for second primary malignancies and others with imids uh, and other features that we can see in marrow toxicity of the older alkylator drugs. Uh, but we also need to understand uh, that this is uh, something that is real to a patient, and so we always want to take that uh, cautious road, as I mentioned, in my first talk. And then, of course, cost is an issue, and we recognize that there's a difference between just the cost of a drug. We're looking down a tunnel if you only look at the cost of a drug. That's not appropriate, because very often costly drugs can actually better a patient's outcomes and reduce the burden of their disease and reduce their total cost. But we do have to, in that vein, also look at the individual cost of the drug and the cost to the patient. And for a lot of these agents, there are uh, particular co-pays for them. Uh, and if that marginal benefit, if the benefit there is only marginal, it's hard for me to rationalize to a patient, yes, you have to pay that $450 co-pay a month, uh, for which many of our patients, it becomes absolutely uh, uh, impossible. And of course, as we've heard, long-term survival is difficult to, to prove. Are we absolutely convinced that drug A, B together in the long term couldn't be given as A, then B? that sequential-like approach, and a lot of these studies are not powered or designed to be able to do that in the long term. Yes, absolutely, and, and, and Dr. Shari had made good comments around the notion that uh, very often your response can later be upgraded by a transplant or upgraded by uh, co further consolidation therapy or potentially even maintenance therapy. If, the, if your individual patient is responding and not experiencing the burden of disease, is it possible to, uh, with time, reach that depth of response as opposed to achieving it right up front? And I would argue, in particular in low-risk disease, this is a value. In high-risk disease, I agree, we need to get the disease down as quickly as possible. But for many of our patients with lower risk burden of disease, the rapidity of response, albeit generally important, may not be explicitly important. And of course, we are gaining momentum in the quality of life argument. And uh, although very often, of course, being in remission gives patients a better quality of life, I'm not minimizing that, we also have to recognize the notion of saying you'll take it and you'll like it <laughs> is not always the best approach for our patients. We need to understand, do they really need that? And this is particularly important. Uh, Dr. Palumbo, who's in the crowd, and many others here have done excellent work in understanding the toxicity of agents in the older population, that as we age, these drugs are more difficult to handle. And we have to assess the impact on the quality of life and in larger spheres. Uh, sixthly, the add-on approach. So a clinical trial is designed to put three drugs against two or four drugs against three, but can we, in clinical practice, start with fewer drugs and add on as we go? And we do this clinically very often, not because the patient is horrifically relapsing, of course, on the first strategy, but may not be getting that optimal response, may not be moving in as much of the direction as you wish, and you can sequentially add it later. Again, in clinical practice, this is something we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then seventhly, the biology of myeloma. We've said this so often that it's very important to recognize that multiple myeloma is called multiple for a reason. If I look at our Mayo database and those patients that have true long-term survival, greater than 15 years, some around 15 up to 20% of them have actually never achieved a complete remission. One of the great things we learned from the Arkansas experiments, of course, was that um, it's worse to have attained, attained a CR and lose it is it better to have loved and lost it 
than to have never loved. You know. So uh, the point is here that we have some of these patients that have never achieved a CR but have a long-term survival. They have that little schmutz of disease left that, as we commented earlier, that indolent clone may actually keep the more aggressive disease at bay. And so patients walking around with the equivalent of a small MGUS, do we have to say, no, 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 we need to get to CR. I'm going to give you four more drugs and I'm going to get rid of that M spike of 0.3 or are you just going to leave it and let the patient live their life? And so it's important that we understand that as we come to this and respect the biology. And then lastly, as I've mentioned, uh, complete remission is not always the goal in every patient. In those genotypically indolent, phenotypically indolent and elderly patients, be careful to coming back from one of these meetings and saying, all right, you're going to get to CR and you're going to like getting to CR, uh, as opposed to individually responding to your patient. Well, in my last few minutes, let me give you some of the evidence then for Cyborg D and Bird. <clears throat> I'm sucking up to the chairs here, but I noticed that this was published by Dr. Nizvitsky and Dr. Coleman, right? Insert hint here. Um, that they looked at their initial response to the bird regimen where there were 70% uh, of patients achieving VGPR or greater. It may not have been right after four cycles, but notice how with time there is a further and a further deepening of response and well tolerability of these regimens with a very good survival whether they went to transplant or not. And then our previous speaker, Adriana Rossi, uh, showed the longer term outcome of this a few years ago with a median follow-up of six and a half years that there was a 93% response rate with VGPR and the 70% range with a median progression free survival of over four years with no increase in second primary malignancy. So this is a very uh, acceptable and reasonable regimen at good cost and high tolerability. So it's highly active, long-term efficacy and safety, minimal toxicity by adding the clarithromycin. And now, of course, we see this quite extensively in amyloidosis. And it's a very act, very attractive when either a, a proteasome inhibitor is not available or tolerated. Similarly for Cyborg D, worldwide, as we have the privilege of traveling the world, this is perhaps the most widely used regimen myeloma on this planet. And that is because of the accessibility of this agent and of the cost of cyclophosphamide. We've evolved, as I mentioned, from twice weekly to once weekly and to subcutaneously. And in the earlier studies uh, that was led by my colleague Shaji Kumar, we saw that in comparison to VRD, the response rates, albeit somewhat inferior, were not dramatically inferior. And this also was reflected in survival. In fact, there may have been increased survival uh, in those patients because of the dose of dexamethasone. The argument had always been, is there long-term follow-up? Well, in our long-term follow-up, albeit not huge numbers, again, we have comparable results and excellent results with Cyborg D demonstrating response rates over 90%, uh, and indeed with VGPR rates in over two-thirds of patients, with survival in standard risk patients over 70% at five years. So. Recently, uh, there was another comparison of Cyborg D and VTD, and the numbers are not massive here on your screen, but again, looking over 90% response, 94% in the Cyborg D cohort, now that Cyborg D has been used on a more weekly basis than on a twice weekly basis in the regimen that I've demonstrated to you before, with very comparable outcomes to the combination of a proteasome inhibitor and an IMID. This has led to one of my colleagues even having his license plate Cyborg D. I won't mention who it is, <coughs> Rafael Fonseca. Uh, but um, so, in, the, in summary, for Cyborg D, it's a very, it's a highly active regimen. We have long-term evidence of it. It's manageable neuropathy, dramatically cheaper uh, than lenalidomide-based regimens, and it's particularly attractive in those patients with renal dysfunction whom it may be more difficult to give lenalidomide in cytopenias and dex intolerance. So my conclusion is, although when available, feasible, and affordable, VRD or KRD remain the primary choice, I want you to consider BIRD and Cyborg D in your patients in particular who may not have access, who are cost prohibitive, who have renal dysfunction, dex intolerance, and cytopenias, and to appreciate the fact that you're not under-treating or poorly treating your patient in doing so, but indeed seeking to give them the best quantity and quality of life they can have. Thank you very much.